to the third chapter of the book of Philippians, please. Philippians chapter 3. He begins with the word finally, but he's not finally done. Uh, he repeats it again in chapter 4, same word. But he's, he's getting to the end. He says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. And that's not the first time he's told us to rejoice in the Lord either. Now, can I remind you that when Paul wrote the book of Philippians, he was a prisoner. He was a prisoner for Jesus. He was in prison for preaching the gospel. And yet he says, rejoice in the Lord. He doesn't even know what's going to happen to him. We know, looking back on it, he probably was released, and then later on, a few years later, rearrested and met his end, died a martyr. But at this point, he didn't know. In fact, he says in the 17th verse of the second chapter, Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. Didn't matter to him. Why? He didn't count his life dear unto himself like we do. He did not count his life dear unto himself. And so he's, he's kind of got the impression he may, this might be the end, but he thinks he's going to maybe survive because look at what he says in verse 23 and 24 of chapter 2. He said, but you know the proof of him that as a son, uh, talking about Timothy, um, actually, <clears throat> He, he says in verse 23, him, therefore, I hope to send presently so soon as I shall see how it will go with me. Verse 24, but I trust in the Lord that I also myself shall come shortly. So he has some hope that he's going to be released and not face a martyr's death, at least at this time. But he's telling us in verse one, doesn't matter. We're to rejoice in the Lord anyway. And he says, to write this same thing to you again and again and again, it's, it's not a burden to me. It doesn't burden me to, to tell you to rejoice. He says, in fact, for you, it's a safeguard. We always need to be reminded that regardless of what our circumstances are, we can rejoice in the Lord. And we must. We have to learn that. And that really comes with a lesson that he teaches in the next chapter, a lesson of contentment. But anyway, I want us to pause a moment, have a word of prayer, and then let's look at this chapter as briefly as we can this morning. Heavenly Father, it's so good for us to be able to come together like this. We thank you that we have such a, a wonderful uh, word right here in this uh, passage of Scripture. Holy Spirit, you are our teacher, and we depend upon you as the one that anoints and gives unction and understanding. Anoint both the messenger as well as the listener. We need your direction. We need your enablement. So, Lord, we pray that we'll accomplish, as you said you would, through your giving forth of your word, the thing that pleases you. Thank you for our time together. May our hearts be responsive and say yes, Lord, to whatever it is that you have to say to us. Might our ears be attuned. We might be listening for that still small voice. <clears throat> Not miss it, but hear it. Lord, we'll thank you for it. We give Jesus the praise for his sake. Amen. What you're going to find in chapter 3 is that it is faith in Christ alone. Now, that happens to be a song that we say, in Christ alone. It's actually the title that I've given to this message, because faith alone is the way that anyone ever comes to know Jesus. But not only that, faith alone is uh, as well the way that anyone comes to enjoy and achieve all that is included in our salvation. When I say faith in Christ, here's what I mean by that. I mean that you come to a point in your life where you exchange, where you transfer your dependence from anything or anyone else to Christ 
alone. That's what I mean by faith in Christ, because some people depend upon Christ, but they add other things into the mix, don't they? Perhaps it's something that they can do, uh, some good thing that they possess, or maybe something that someone else can add to them or do for them. But the Christian life begins and ends with Christ. Remember how Paul put it in the eighth chapter of uh, the book of Romans, where he is saying that the purpose of our salvation is that we might be conformed to the image of Christ. And then as he concludes that passage, here's what he says. He says, uh, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. And he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30 that those that are in Christ, Christ is made unto them really all that we need. He is our righteousness. He is our wisdom. He is our sanctification. He is our redemption. Everything that the believer has and needs is in Christ alone. And so that's what we're talking about. And this third chapter that makes that focus, faith in Christ and faith in Christ alone, is going to uh, enable us to consider three parts of salvation. And uh, I want you to know these parts, and I want you to know these words. The first would be the word justify. And that's really what the first nine verses are all about. You know what it means to be justified as a believer? It means to, uh, it's being in a right relationship with God. So as you sit here this morning, or as you listen this morning, consider and ask yourself, am I justified? Am I in a right relationship with God? And he's going to tell us, how that can happen. And he makes it very clear in the first six verses, there's only one way it happens, and it is not by works. It's not by works. In fact, he warns, he warns about those that would want to mix works with faith. It's not to be done. Listen what he says here in the second verse. Beware, that's a warning, beware of dogs Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. Now, let's unpack that a little bit. Beware of dogs. Well, you know, the Orthodox Jewish people, even to this day, if they're honest, would consider Gentiles like myself to be spiritual dogs. Religiously, we're dogs. We're unclean, right? But what Paul is saying, and in a moment, he's going to tell us he was a Pharisee. You mean, you, you, you're talking about the strictest sect of Judaism he once was a member of, and yet he is calling these Orthodox Jewish people who are legalists, he's calling them dogs. He's calling them scavengers. He's picturing the fact that uh, what they do is they come behind solid Bible preaching and teaching like the Apostle Paul, and they try to scavenge up uh, disciples by planting their false teachings into those people's minds and, uh, and taking them away, and also, like dogs, following Paul, causing him trouble, barking at his heels, nipping at him, so to speak. So, he calls these false teachers, these legalists, these Orthodox Jews that are legalists, he calls them dogs. Beware of dogs, he says. And then he says, beware of evil workers. Evil workers. Now, what were they teaching, these legalists? Well, they were teaching, uh, For uh, their main teaching was that in order to be saved, not only do you need faith in Christ, but you needed to be circumcised if you were a man. You need to be circumcised in order to 
to be saved. And of course, that was shot down clearly in the council, the church of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15, remember? But uh, there is still this group that are trying to uh, make that part of the criteria of salvation. Well, isn't it interesting that he calls what they would call good works, like circumcision, evil works? He calls them evil workers. And I think we should, uh, we should say that good works become evil works whenever they are added to faith in Christ alone. Anything that people call good works, if it is added to dependence on Christ alone, they're no longer good, they're evil, because they, are, they condemn a person. They trip a person up, and they steer them away from Christ and put reliance upon man, upon themselves. Paul said it in another passage in Titus 3 and verse 5, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. We're rescued from sin. We're rescued from hell. We're rescued from eternal death, not by any works that we do, but only on one basis, and that is the mercy of Christ by faith in him alone. And he says, he calls them, notice, the concision. That word concision is really mutilation. And it is a pun, an intended pun on Paul's part. These men, these false teachers, these legalists that are requiring circumcision in addition to faith in Christ, he says they are a bunch of mutilators. They just want to mutilate your body. That's the word concision there. And he says, Notice this, we are the circumcision, meaning we are the true Jewish believer, Paul, that were not only biological Jewish men, but they were spiritually the true Jew. We'll talk about that in a moment because uh, Paul addresses that in Romans chapter 2. Remember what he says there in that uh, second chapter? Uh, he, he tells them that here is a true Jew. You're, he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Outwardly, a, an allusion to circumcision alone, a legalistic basis, you know, basing your Judaism on keeping the Torah. He says he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is in outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew. A true Jewish person is someone who is not merely biologically born Jewish, but also one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men but of God. The first time you ever see any reference to a circumcision, not of the flesh, but of the heart in the scripture, is way back in the Torah. It's in chapter 30 of Deuteronomy in verse 6, where uh, Moses is talking about the fact there's coming a day when God is going to circumcise the heart of Israel. And that's what Paul says here is a genuine Jewish person, someone who is not relying upon some outward mark on the flesh, mutilating their flesh, but rather someone who has an inward, an inward cutting away of the callousness and the deadness of the spiritual heart. It's like the prophet Ezekiel says, there's coming a day when the whole nation of Israel will have their old stony heart taken away and will be replaced with a heart of flesh. That's the circumcision of heart that he's talking about here. And that's what he says. We are the circumcision. In other words, in heart, which, verse 3, worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Now, the flesh here, very simple. The flesh is 
Anyone who's living their life based on self-effort, anyone depending upon themselves, anyone that is working for God's approval. And then he talks about, if you want to put flesh credentials up as the criteria, I'll go through that with you. And that's what uh, verses four to six uh, is what Paul is doing there. But for a moment, let's just talk about, let's just talk about this. He says, verse three, we worship God in the spirit. There's not a certain place that you have to worship God. You know, here we are, and we come here on regular occasions into this building. Doesn't even look like a church building, you know, as far as uh, what people would think of if they were, if you said, I, I'm going to church, they would think probably of a building that has a steeple on it. Doesn't look like a church building outside. Uh, does it look like a church building inside? I guess, yeah, to some degree it does, but this is not the place that people should think you have to be in order to worship. I mean, you need to be together and worship publicly. The Bible teaches that, and I'm, and I'm not discounting that at all. But it's not about a specific place where worship happens. You should be having worship on a regular basis even when we're not meeting here. But when we come together like this, there should be public worship taking place. But worship isn't, uh, isn't at a particular location. Worship is not, uh, isn't uh, just a specific set of orders or rules or rituals that have to be followed in order for it to qualify for worship. I'm convinced that much of the evangelical world, Bible-believing people, don't really know what worship is. But I would challenge you sometime to do a study of it, and you'll find that every time people are worshiping, they're bowing down, they're on their face before God. When they're praising, their hands are in the air. When they're thanking, they're, they're up. But when they're worshiping, they're on their face. They're on the ground. They're bent over uh, in obeisance and reverence to God. But anyway, that's a sidebar. What he says here is we worship God in the spirit. We don't worship God by certain rituals that have to be performed. That's the thing. And he said, if you want to go by flesh credentials, listen to this. Verse 4, if anyone could have confidence in self-effort, in religious uh, uh, works, I certainly could. If I wanted to talk about it, I could, and he does talk about it. He says, here it is, verse 5, I was circumcised the eighth day, just according to the Levitical law. The, the law of the Torah. He was circumcised as a, as a baby on the eighth day after his birth. Of the stock of Israel, he has, uh, uh, he's, he's a, a genuine biological Jewish man. Uh, he's putting his credentials up against these legalists, these false teachers. And he says, of the tribe of Benjamin, remember the tribe of Benjamin? Benjamin was one of the two favorite sons of, of Jacob, right? They were the, uh, there was Joseph and there was Benjamin, the two sons of his favorite wife, Rachel. And so he says, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin, first king of Israel, Benjamite. A Hebrew of the Hebrews. In other words, I, was a gen, I am a genuine uh, Jewish man. I am steeped in Hebrew culture. Even though he lived in the diaspora, he, he lived in what is today uh, what we would call uh, Eastern Turkey, the Tarsus, yet he was a, a true uh, Jewish man. As touching the law, he says, I was a Pharisee, the strictest sect of Judaism in that day. Concerning zeal, he persecuted the church, and we know a lot about that. We know that that, that uh, the Lord stopped him in his tracks, and uh, he was saved on his way to persecute the church there in Syria, Damascus. Touching the righteousness which in the, is in the law, blameless. In other words, he, he uh, 
outwardly was a strict, observant Jewish Pharisee. All of that, he says, if I could have confidence in the flesh, I could talk about my national heritage. I could talk about my religious achievements. You know, this is really the basis of all religion, isn't it? Not just uh, Orthodox Judaism, but it's the basis of Islam and and uh, Roman Catholicism, which is a false uh, Christianity. All of this, uh, they, they all do the same thing. They struggle to have their good uh, works outweigh their bad works. Well, that's flesh confidence. That's exactly what he's condemning here. That is the epitome of self-righteousness. And self-righteousness is just totally based in pride. Uh, because you can then boast upon what you have accomplished as a result of your self-effort. And so it ought to be very clear that uh, if we are right in the eyes of God, being right with God, being in a right relationship with him, it's not by works. How is it then? Well, look at verse 7 uh, to 9, and here is how. But what things were gained to me? And he just talked about his, uh, he talked about his national heritage, his rel- religious achievements. Those were gained to him at one point in his life. But now those things, he said, I count loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but but dung, but uh, refuse, garbage, that I may win Christ, gain him, and be found in him, listen to this, here it is, not having mine own righteousness, not having self-righteousness, we would say, which is of the law, which is by observing rules and rituals. Here he's talking about Judaism, but again, it could apply to any religion and their rituals and their rules. He says, that's not how I want to be found. He says, but rather through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. So being in a right relationship with God is by faith. Personal saving faith, a personal saving relationship by depending upon Jesus alone. What are you depending upon to be to, to get God's favor? What are you depending upon to be in a right relationship with the Lord? Paul says there's only one thing, and that is that you depend upon Jesus. He lost his self-righteousness to obtain Christ's righteousness. You know, every person that truly is born again has to come to that place, don't they? where they lose their self-righteousness, where they stop depending upon something that they can do for themselves or that some priest or rabbi or minister can do on their behalf in order to get them God's approval. You have to get past that if you're ever going to be in a right relationship with the Lord. And here's uh, what Paul says about the Jewish people. In Romans chapter 9, he, sa- he, he says in the 30th verse that the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith, which is what he's talking about in Philippians 3.9. He says, but Israel, the Jewish people, which followed after the law of righteousness by observing the Torah, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? He says, wherefore? Because They sought it not by faith. Simple as that. But as it were, by the works of the law. That's the dividing line. And this is the whole way in which anyone can be in a right relationship with the Lord. Not by works, but by faith. And by faith, we mean that you exchange or transfer all of your dependence from yourself or anyone else to Jesus alone. So that's the word justify. 
that he deals with here in the first uh, nine verses of this chapter. Picking up with verse 10 and down through verse 19, there's another Bible word that I want to introduce to you. Not only justify or the theological term justification, that's being in a right relationship with the Lord. Now, these verses, beginning in verse 10, have to deal with sanctification or sanctify. The second part of salvation, not only justify, but sanctify, verses 10 through 19. What does it mean to be sanctified? It, it is living in a right relationship with God. Justify being in a right relationship. Sanctify living in a right relationship with God. Now, this is specifically directed to believers. Previous, unbelievers. Justify, unbelievers. This is for you if you claim to be a believer. Are you living in a right relationship with God? Well, what is that about? Well, look at what he says in verse 10 as we pick it up. He says that I may know him, meaning Jesus, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. What's he talking about there? Simply this. How does God sanctify? God saying, are you with me? I, some of you look distant, like you're, you're focus with me, please. Stay on track with me, okay? Are you awake? Yes. I know it's uh, still morning. Stay with me. At least let me know that you're with me. How do you, how do you, how does God accomplish this practical aspect of sanctification? We know there's a sanctification that is positional. That is, the moment you're saved, you know, you're set apart to God. That, that's position. But how does the practical part work? How do you live in a right relationship with God? Here's how. He's telling us in these 10th and 11th verse, it's by fellowship with Christ. It's by fellowship with the Lord. I would say that verses 10 and 11 ought to be your highest ambition in life as a believer. The believer's greatest ambition is to do what verse 10 and 11 says, and that is to personally experience a knowledge of Christ. I'm not talking about filling your head with information about Jesus, but I'm talking about a personal experiential knowledge of him, where he is real in your life, where you know that Jesus lives, and he lives in you, and he's impacting you, and he's living through you, and he's accomplishing things in your life and through your life. That's what it means here to know Christ. That's, what it, that's how you get sanctified in a practical sense. It is fellowship with Christ, and it's a powerful experience. That's what he says in that 10th verse. The power of his resurrection. It's a powerful experience. It's uh, also a painful experience because he also talks about the fellowship of his sufferings. And it is really a very practical experience being made conformable, he says, unto his death. But it is the peak of Christian living. And it is simply this. When he says being made conformable unto his death, what he's talking about there is that to sanctify us, we have to cooperate with the Holy Spirit of God that lives in us. We have to cooperate with the living Christ in this way. We have to constantly die. What does that mean? It means we deny ourselves. We say no to ourselves. You know, you might want to do something this afternoon, but maybe the Holy Spirit is saying, you know, you really ought to stay for the second service. And so you have a choice to make. You have a choice to make. Are you going to say no to self or are you going to say no to the Spirit? 
Now, I don't, I, I don't know your, your situation, but I'm just using that as an, as an example. You have to learn to say no to your self-life. This is what it's about. If you're going to experience the Christ life, you can't, you can't experience the self-life and the Christ life at the same time. One of them has to go, and that's the way it works. Either you're living the self-life or you're living the Christ life. You can't live them together. It's one or the other. And that's what this is all about, to be made conformable unto his death. It's to say no to the self-life so that you can experience the miraculous, powerful resurrection life that is already in you that God wants to unleash through you. That's what Paul meant, too, when he said, I'm crucified with Christ. I've said no to myself. I'm saying no to myself. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. I've said no to the self-life so that the Christ life can be activated and energized through my life. So sanctify, it requires fellowship with Christ but it requires following Christ as well. That's really what verses 12 to 19 are all about. To, to, to enjoy the practical aspect of sanctification in your life, you have to have fellowship with Christ. You have to follow Christ. Look at how he puts it. Uh, not as though I had already attained. Well, what's he talking about attaining? Verse 11, if by any means I might attain, I might seize, I might grab hold of the resurrection of the dead. Now, he's not talking about that future event when our bodies are resurrected out of the grave. And I'll get uh, more into that in the afternoon because we're going to focus on verses 10 and 11. But it's a specific word that he uses here, literally, that I might attain unto the out-resurrection. The out-resurrection. And I think what he's talking about here is that he wants to constantly experience denying self and saying yes to Jesus. He wants that to be his constant experience. And he says, I haven't attained that yet, verse 12. I haven't gotten there yet. I have not reached perfect sanctification, is what he's saying. But I want to follow the Lord. I want to follow after, he says, that I might grab hold of, that I might apprehend the very thing for which Jesus grabbed hold of me, apprehended me. Brethren, I don't count myself, verse 13, to have already Reach the, 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 the peak of sanctification. But I'll tell you what I do. I do one thing. I focus on one thing. And that is, I forget what's behind, and I reach forth unto things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Here's what he's saying. And I hope that you say this. Paul is basically saying, personally, I have an honest, holy dissatisfaction with the spiritual level that I've attained to. Woe unto me, or any believer, that is happy with where they are in their spiritual level of growth and sanctification. I mean... I thank the Lord for the difference that he's made in my life up to this point. But he's got a lot of work to do. There's still a lot that needs to be done. And if you're honest, same thing you would say about yourself as well. But the thing that really matters is that we're not focused upon the, the, the ways in which we failed. We're not focused upon even the ways in which we succeeded. But what we are focused on is that God's at work in my life. God's at work in me. He's, in, he's at work in, all around me, and I want to follow him and be a part. I want to partner with him and let him do whatever he wants to do in and through my life. I have a single focus, highly motivated, Paul says. I'm highly motivated. I have a personal singular 
singular focus and I'm devoted to it. And it is, he calls it the prize. And I think that prize is what he mentioned in verse 10, being made conformable unto his death. He's talking about a total Christ conformity, which is the ultimate for every believing life. That's God's purpose. You know, all things work together for good. Someone reminded, reminded me of that on Wednesday evening after the ceiling collapsed and we had a whole flood of water in our new carpet. Yeah. I wish I would have thought about that, you know, at the moment, but it was after it was done. But, you know, the fact of the matter is we can quote that verse, but we don't know the context. And the context of that verse, the reason everything works together for good is because everything that God allows into our sphere of experience is meant to conform us to the image of Christ. Well, in the end, there is a total conformity to Christ. And I think that's what the prize is that he's talking about here in these verses. He says in verse 15, let us therefore as many as be perfect, as be mature, be thus minded. And if in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. That's how I feel. I don't believe that all of us have to be on the same page. I don't think that you have to dot every I and cross every T uh, the way I interpret the Bible, the way I see it. But uh, I, I say what Paul says, you know, in time, God's going to reveal to you that you're wrong. And you'll see it. Or he'll reveal to me. Listen, I have, I've, I've changed my view over a period of pastoring now for over 40 years. I've changed my view a lot. Okay. And I don't think I have a corner on the truth. I, I am liable to see things wrongly, and uh, I can God can correct that in me, and I'm open to that, and I'm glad that he does. Uh, it's, it's a great thing. But the fact of the matter is, folks, God wants you to follow him, and he wants you to follow uh, him and hang with people that follow him. That's what Paul means. He's not bragging. Uh, Paul, when he says what he does here in this passage, he says um, uh, in verse 17, brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which you have uh, uh, us for an example. <clears throat> he's not bragging there, but he's telling them, you know what? You got to hang with the right people. Even in the Christ in Christian circles, you better be careful who you hang with because you can be pulled into real carnality even by hanging out with people who are Christians but are living the self-life instead of the Christ life. They're making choices for them uh, to please themselves instead of saying no to self in order to please Christ. And he's talking specifically about these legalists, these Jewish legalists, because in verse 18 he says, for many walk of whom I have told you often, and now I tell you, even with tears in my eyes, weeping. They're the enemies of the cross of Christ. I wish these men, they believe in faith in Christ, but they add these works like circumcision and uh, kosher diet. He said, I, I wish, but he said, their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. I think that has to do with their diet, kosher diet. Their glory is in their shame, their mutilation that they uh, want men to uh, practice, and they mind earthly things. They're all focused on the externals. They're all focused on the ritual. They're all focused on the, the religion and not on and, and the rules and not on things that are heavenly, things that are eternal. Remember what Paul said in Colossians 3, set your affection on what? Things, things above. above. Things above, yeah. Uh, if you be risen with Christ, then set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth, but where Christ sits, heavenly things. Don't follow destructive legalists is what he's saying, but rather uh, follow the example. This is what it means to live in a right relationship 
with the Lord. Sanctify. Well, there's a third word that I want to close with. It's uh, verses 20 uh, and 21 here in Philippians chapter 3. And here's what he says. For our conversation, that word conversation is actually a political term. The original language, it, it is a word that has to do with citizenship. <laughs> He's talking to people in the city of Philippi. It was a Roman colony that was very privileged. It was originally started by uh, the father of Alexander, Philip of Macedonia. He planted this colony, and he had some of his soldiers uh, move there to start this city of Philippi. And it was a privileged Roman uh, outpost and uh, had full rights of citizenship uh, uh, as Roman citizenship uh, because of it and did not have to pay taxes to Rome either. They're tax-free uh, colony. And so he, but he, he, he reminds them in verse 20, you're not a citizen mainly of Rome. Your citizenship is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Here's the third word. We talked about justification, justify. We talked about sanctification, sanctify. Here's the third word. It's glorification. Good theological word and Bible word. Glorification. Glorify. What is that? Well, if justify is being in a right relationship with God and sanctify is living in a right relationship with God, then glorify is eternally having a right relationship with God. Eternally having a right relationship with God. Glorify, glorification. And in these verses that deal with that uh, subject of our glorification as believers, there is a now and a then aspect. Okay? A now and a then aspect. In verse 20, again, our conversation or citizenship is in heaven. That is something that now is true. This is amazing. You and I, we are true believers, are currently already members of God's family, and we are heavenly homeowners. You know, Jesus, before he left, he said, I'm going to go, I'm going to prepare a place for you. In my father's house are many mansions, many huge rooms, and I'm going to go prepare a special place for you. I'm going to add on to my father's house, and you're going to dwell there with me forever. Well, what we understand here, we're already citizens of heaven. We're already heavenly homeowners. Now, some of the... Some of the, I guess, most exciting times in some people's lives is when you become a homeowner. Little do you know that that's when the real work begins, right? <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, the thing that ought to really get your attention and, and ought to thrill your heart is not that you are a earthly homeowner, but you're a heavenly homeowner. You're a citizen of heaven, is what he says here. And, uh, you remember how John puts it? He says, uh, beloved, dearly loved by God. Beloved, now are you the children of God. Now are you the children of God. Not sometime in the future, but now. You're citizens of heaven. You're children of God. Um, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me and my Father's house or many mansions. You're citizens. You know what the key is? aspect of citizenship is loyalty. Well, back in the 40s, they came up with what we call the Pledge of Allegiance, right? And that is a loyalty pledge to the United States of America. Well, we are called to a loyalty pledge to heaven's cause because our citizenship is in heaven. Where you know what heaven's cause is, by the way? Here's what it is it's not about you, it's about others. Heaven's cause is not you, 
it's not self. It's giving. It's not getting. It's loving. It's not hating. It's living your life for what really matters. And what really matters is the Lord and the things that pertain to the Lord. Okay, that's the now aspect of glorification. But there's a future. There's a then aspect. And the second part of that verse uh, tells us that we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He hasn't come yet, but we're looking for him. This is actually, we're eagerly looking for him. We're looking for heaven's Lord. We're looking for the king uh, whose uh, kingdom we're citizens of. We're eagerly awaiting Jesus' return. John goes on to say, now you're the children of God, but it has not yet become manifest what you shall be, but we know when he shall appear, you're going to be like him. You're going to see him as he is, and you are going to be like him so shall you ever be with the Lord, right? The, he'll descend from heaven with a shout. Dead in Christ will be raised. You'll be caught up with them to meet the Lord in the clouds. Wonderful. This is the then aspect. We're looking for heaven's Lord or the king. He's coming. And when Jesus returns, look at what he'll do. He's going to do a couple of things here. One of the things he's going to he's going to do is going to change our our vile bodies. You have a vile body. <clears throat> our present state of mortality, uh, a literally a body of humiliation. You have a vile body. He's going to take that vile body and he's going to completely transform it. And you know what? It's going to happen in the twinkling of an eye. It's going to happen, the Bible says, so quickly in an atomic particle of a second. It's going to happen, and we will all be changed as believers. Our bodies will be changed, and this corrupt, vile body will be will, will put on incorruption, and this, mortal, this mortal body will put on immortality, and it will be a body just like his. That's what this verse tells us. Be a body like Jesus' resurrection body. That was pretty different, wasn't it? It must have had a, 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 a different molecular structure because he was able to just appear in a room when the door was locked. We'll have a body like that. It, it will be instant uh, transport uh, wherever God wants us. It, it'll be fashioned like his glorious body, According to the working whereby he is even able, it says, to subdue all things to himself. When he, Jesus, returns, he's going to subdue all things to himself. That word subdue means to arrange in ranks, like an army is arranged in ranks. He's going to arrange everything in ranks as he sees fit. You know what we need to do? We really need to start living our lives now by letting Jesus arrange in proper rank and order our lives, our priorities. There's only one of two ways, remember, that you and I can live. We can either live in the flesh without God, or we can live in the spirit with God and with all his resources. There was a young man by the name of Albert Ornsborn. He was one of the early leaders of the Salvation Army. And he was actually became one of their great poets and, and songwriters. In the early years, he was promoted to be a district uh, commander in the city of London. And God really began to profoundly uh, bless his work in that district. In fact, they had revival break out among uh, the segments of the Salvation Army that he was in charge of. And they saw tremendous conversions of uh, sinners that were brought to the Lord and added to that group. One day, one of the officers under Arsborne came to him and said, I heard a rumor that the upper brass is going to divide our district, and we can't let this happen because God's blessing so much, and if they divide our district up, it's going to hinder God's work, so we need to fight it. Well, Orsborn said, uh, no, I, I, I want to do God's will and respect my superiors. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to fight it. 
Well, when his superiors called him in one day to tell him that they had planned to divide his district, he, he suddenly felt in his heart that he didn't want that to happen. And he knew if they divided his district, he would lose some prestige. He would lose some power. And uh, so he began to argue <laughs> with his superiors. Looking back on it, here's what he said. Unwittingly, I had begun to fight not for the kingdom, but my position in it. And the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit grieves, he leaves. Uh, he didn't mean that he lost the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He meant he lost the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit grieves, he leaves. So he managed to continue to go through the motions as a Salvation Army officer, but he sensed that there was a, really a strange distance between him and the Lord, that there was a spiritual coldness that, that moved over him, and an indifference and a hardening of his heart came upon him. But he kept serving the Lord, but he was empty inside. And one day he had a serious car accident. He ended up in the hospital with a long time to recover. And while he was in that state of convalescing, the Holy Spirit began to deal with his heart. And one day he heard a group of people uh, singing next door uh, to his house, and they were singing about God's glory. And his heart began to yearn once again for that same intimacy with his Lord that he had known before. And so he wept his heart out, really, in repentance. And the Holy Spirit came to him and cleansed him and filled his heart afresh. And as a result, he wrote this new hymn. Here it is. Savior, if my feet have faltered on the pathway of the cross, if my purpose purposes have altered or my gold be mixed with dross. Oh, forbid me, not thy servant, keep me yet in thy employ. Pass me through a sterner cleansing, if I may but give thee joy. When you have come to intimately know the Lord, you never want to lose that intimacy. And like this man, when you know that there's something in your heart that is come between you and God that separates you from the Lord, you say, Lord, take this rebellious attitude out of me that the, so there's no unbroken fellowship and I can once again walk with you in the Spirit and live in the Spirit. Amen. Let's bow our heads together, shall we? Let's be close. So how is it with you? Can you honestly say that, yes, I am justified. I am living. I am in a right relationship with the Lord. I know I am because my trust is in Christ alone. I'm not trusting anything that I can do to get God's favor or his approval. I am justified by faith in Jesus alone. If you can honestly say that, this morning. That's a good thing. But if you have any doubt whatsoever, you need to settle this. You can't go on just thinking that if you do this, that, or the other, that it's going to be approved. No, you have to depend on Jesus alone. Then secondly, if you are justified, what about the sanctified part? <laughs> are you living in a right relationship with the Lord right now? Are you living in a right relationship with the Lord right now? And if you're not sure, I think if you're really a believer, you know whether you are or not. The Holy Spirit in you will let you know that. So are you living in a right relationship with the Lord? Is there something that you are holding out on God about? Some area that you will not submit to him in? Is there an area of rebellion in your heart? You're fighting the Lord yet. Maybe you have been for quite a while. The Lord wants you to surrender it today. He wants you to put up the white flag of surrender and say, I'm done, Lord. I'm, I'm, I'm getting right with you today. I want to live in a right relationship. I don't merely 
want to be in a, I want to live in it. I want that living reality in my life. If you're here today and you're a believer and you know there's something in your heart, the area of self that the Holy Spirit has put his finger on and you want to get that right with the Lord, why don't you do that right now? Why don't you do that right now? Just as, as, as we were speaking, that man that he wanted so badly to get right with the Lord. Have you ever known an intimacy with God? And if so, have you lost it? You want it back? Was your heart burning perhaps sometime in the past? Now it's cold. Maybe you need to do some business with us, with the Lord right now and ask him to take that rebellious attitude out of you and give you that unbroken fellowship that you might once again walk in the spirit. We have all kinds of encouragement and hope to look forward to, but hey, what about now? So as we sing our closing number, you do business with the Lord. And you settle anything that the Holy Spirit of God is dealing with your heart about, will you? Don't leave. And don't uh, let this service close without you getting things that need to be dealt with squared away with God.